Okay. Okay. <coughs> Okay, hello everyone. I'm just testing the audio, just making sure everything's fine. We'll start in just over nine minutes. My name is Christian Zasse. I run the channel called Zasse Photo. We do education on raptors and wildlife. And um, hope you can all hear me. Uh, so we have a, yeah, we have, one second, I have an audio problem here. Let me just check out my audio. But yeah, it seems fine now. So I'm just going to do a little bit of a preview for you on the Decora Nest. So I'll see you in about uh, just over eight minutes then. Thank you.
Hello everyone and welcome to a very special stream today. I'm just adjusting my camera here uh, so that uh, everything's okay. Um, welcome to a very special stream today. So last week we heard about the tragic death at, uh, of the two eaglets uh, who've gone through a severe winter and now this. So everybody's asking what happened at the North Decorah nest. And it's quite an important question. So what has happened? Is this normal? Is this an event we often actually see in nature? Is it just because we're watching the nest uh, uh, because it's a very popular nest? Or maybe there are other incidents in nature. Is it climate change? Many questions come up and they're not simple to answer. Well, I'm very glad to have John Howe here, who's actually been on the show before from the Raptor Resource Project. And um, do feel free to answer lo uh, ask lots of questions. This is what it's about. So I'm going to introduce him for about five minutes and then just pour in with your questions. So this is going to be your big chance and your opportunity to learn more about the background. So you've seen some beautiful tributes and I hope you enjoyed them. So I'm going to switch over now to, to John and introduce him. So uh, one second, let me just do this. Hi, John. Can you hear me? Let's see. Oh, a stream seems to be frozen. One second. John? Hey, I see you there. Hi, okay. Christian. Okay, very good. John's live. Excellent. John, very nice to have you on the show. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, unfortunately, nice. unfortunately, this time it's a very tragic incident, but um, you've told me a lot already. Uh, you're so dedicated, so maybe you can give us a little bit of background, what has happened and so on, and then I will pass it on to the viewers to ask more questions. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start this out by, by thanks to you, Christian, and, and to uh, our Explore partners help, helping with this nest and landowners, and, and thanks all for viewing. Um, Interesting with the Decorah North Nest. Uh, I remember just with all that's happened recently, just the 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 days of getting this prepped with the three landowners there with Bob as another another way to educate people and tell the story about bald eagles uh, and and tell about nature. And so the interesting thing about this nest is that it is out more in the country than the Decorah Eagle Nest, the one that reached uh, uh, acclaim back in 2011. And so these, we call them the country cousins up in the, up north of Decorah. And so it's a more rural location and we see differences there. Um, what happened this year with the Decorah North Nest, um, we've, we've, we've seen over the last couple of years, we started uh, broadcasting this one in 2016. So this will be the third season now. Um, we've seen some hardships there because of uh, not as much food. We've had... We've seen some hardships there because of uh, uh, we had a poisoning incident where where uh, 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 insecticide was consumed by by mom Decor North and one of the eaglets had died there because of consuming that. So um, this year uh, we were hoping to be different. Uh, um, the first thing that we saw was when it was time to to lay eggs. Uh, mom Decor North she she appeared to be a little bit sick. Uh, she didn't uh, hold down her, her fish uh, before egg laying like she normally they normally do. And uh, she only ended up laying one egg through that first cycle. And it was a little bit late uh, also compared to what we had seen in the past and what we see at the Decor Fish Hatchery Nest. So um, mom, she and, and dad, De Decor North, incubated that egg. And it went on for 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 probably over a week or so. And, and basically, uh, tragically, that egg, something was wrong with it, and the egg got crushed. Um, so at that point, we were all crushed, and I know a lot of you viewers and folks who are watching that were too, and we really had a lot of questions, just really what, what happened here? Why did we not get the normal three eggs? Why did the egg crush under just the weight of a, a, a eagle sitting on it? So um, while we were trying to figure out that, we knew from talking to some uh, board members and, and other eagle experts that it's a possibility that we could have a reclutch here and we could have uh, another set of eggs. So we, we kind of held that open there thinking that it might happen. And uh, right about when we thought that 
it was probably past time they had been copulating and doing all the right stuff, you know, things that eagles do before they lay eggs. And sure enough, uh, mom, Decora North, and, and dad there surprised us with actually two eggs. So a reclutch of two eggs. And um, we thought, this is great. Isn't it going to be great? We're going to get to see eaglets again and have more of that enjoyment to watch them and, and actually get to watch this nest. Uh, uh, landowners, we were thrilled about that and just being able to have another another event to, to watch and, and experience. And um, then basically uh, uh, we, we watched those first days, you know, the tender moments, the first feedings, the hatch of D, DN7, then DN8, and their initial beak tussling and things that they do that are, are, are really fun to watch. And, and uh, um, uh, you mentioned the snows, and, and that was probably during the incubation. That was during the incubation time period, which was amazing in itself, just to watch them in a foot of snow trying to incubate two eggs to hatch point. So, uh, but once they had hatched and, and, and were growing that first week, they go anywhere from like up to three, from three ounces up to almost a pound there in that first week. And we noticed the, the flies, gnats uh, showing up there. We had some extreme heat events and it looked like it was going to be a challenge. Um, with that heat, the parents won't sit down as tight on them, um, but we were hoping that the parent on top of the eaglets would would help shield them from some of the the insects, and um, it did not. And the heat persisted, and unfortunately, we lost those two eaglets. Uh, it was on that Friday. Yeah, John, and how did this differ from last year? I mean, we've had you've uh, we've just seen the picture. I'm just going to blend in a few pictures that you've. So just give me a second. Let's see if we can get this in. Yes, that's it. Um, so, yeah, so, so there's a picture right there of, uh, that's dad, Decora North, and he is uh, incubating those two eggs. And that was right after we had the Easter snowstorm, and then we had another snowstorm a couple days after that. I think it was on the 18th, and it was over a foot of heavy wet snow. So this photo was taken while he was taking his incubation turn there before the hatch uh, at the at the nest. Uh, um, but if you're if you're mentioning about other you know prior year, um, we did have three eggs hatch uh, the prior year, and we did not see any of this uh, you know the the only one egg and the delayed laying of the eggs uh, um, like we did this year. So there's what you're showing there is another shot of one of the eagles. Uh, I'm not sure if that's mom or dad down in kind of like a donut hole there. Amazing when you think about it, a foot of snow. And they're still keeping that egg, you know, up around uh, 100, 100 uh, so degrees, keeping that egg warm and incubating that with uh, um, all that snow around there, heavy, wet snow. Pretty yes, amazing. But actually, actually, snow is a very good insulator. So we know that from the Eskimos and so on. So the eagles seem right. to be doing something similar there, right? Um, it, it's having some effect. Uh, um, and I'm trying to remember, uh, I don't know exactly what the ambient temperature was there though, but uh, um, eagles are so well insulated that that small area, when it snows like this, we've seen them get up and kind of shed their wings and, and then shake the snow off of that immediate area. So they're, they're very good at keeping that area clear right where the egg, the, pretty much the focused imprint area of where they sit over the eggs and the eaglets. Um, there's a neat shot right there. Um, and and I think it's fish that's being fed, and and I believe that we've got DN7 that is in in the foreground there, and DN8 is in the background there, and uh, you know it just looked like a normal normal first week of eaglet life in the nest, uh, and and we were just all enjoying that and watching that, and um, like I said, the 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 interesting thing here and the difference uh, we'll talk about the. The eagle farmers but the interesting thing this year was just the eaglets hatched at a time period where the weather was warm and where we have the overlapping of the the uh, uh, hatching of another species of insects so some beautiful shots there there's one with the sunrise coming up in the morning a I absolutely absolutely uh, 
And then the one that you showed before, that's one of my favorites. Uh, I think we have the first uh, eagle corn farmers here that has ever been reported in the world. But uh, um, they <laughs> it's amazing. Corn, yeah, they bring up corn husks and, and uh, cobs and things like that, and they use that for nesting materials. And Mom North is, is pretty uh, famous for flipping corn tassels and, and husks and stuff up in the air and, and when she's sitting there incubating or whatever. But this one kernel of corn that must have got planted there from the prior year grew. And this nest, I think I was mentioning this to you before, this nest is probably approaching about 11 feet in the depth as you're looking into the picture there. Um, and probably about eight and a half to uh, nine feet wide there. So when you measure that out, this nest is huge. It's really deceiving um, when you see an eagle in there. But eagle being close to three feet standing there, you can, you can measure that across and see that this is really a huge nest. And that's about a six and a half to seven foot stalk uh, of corn. And it actually has an ear of corn that had silk coming out of it. And, and we did harvest that one ear of corn. Uh, Amy Reese uh, um, is, is carefully protecting that, that ear of corn. We might have our own eagle corn someday. Well, we haven't. I, I, we don't have anything like this in Canada. It's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> so that's, it is pretty amazing. What other state in the United States to have eagles planting corn other than Iowa, huh? Well, that's incredible. Um, there's one picture I really would like to show. Maybe you can comment on this one. It's so yeah. Beautiful. That's a real. That's a really neat uh, picture, and I think it's got sentimental value to a lot of people. Um, this is, uh, I think, the morning after the eaglets had perished. This is probably Saturday morning. I know that happened on a Friday. And it's just beautiful, the sights that come up there in the morning. The sun had risen. Uh, I think that was Dad, uh, Decora North, who's sitting there on uh, on one of the, the branches there. And we've got these prisms of light uh, reflecting in the camera dome. And it just, uh, you know, I think it, it means more for us as humans to see that and kind of connect it as kind of a somber reflective day, if, if you want to say, um, of just the, the amazing thing that happened with the reclutch of the, the eagles, um, surviving and incubating them through those, those snowstorms, and then having the hatch, and seeing the baby eaglets, and seeing them moving on to another uh, uh, clutch of, uh, or another, uh, you know, two eaglets, and then all of a sudden that tragically being taken away by just... Uh, the, the insect infestation and just the time of year there and the, and the high heat that we were seeing. Yeah, John, uh, before, uh, before I hand it over to the audience, so please prepare your questions, by the way. Uh, I've, I've seen so many people. We have over 340 people at the moment. It's wonderful to see that. So please, this is your big opportunity. This is not about me talking. It's about you talking to John. Uh, that's what it's really about. So feel free to throw in lots of questions. Nicole and my team will pass them on to me. So please feel free to ask. I'm just going to um, start the uh, interview, really, John, with one question. I mean, you, you look after many raptors. Have you seen this type of, um, you know, sudden death or a pathogen come in in any other um, in incident so far? Yeah, so with eagles, we and we see it down at the fish hatchery right now, we see we see the insects there. We see them bothering them. Um, so it's there. But um, right now, at this time of year, small eaglets with just that that uh, fuzzy, downy covering, they're unable to thermoregulate at the time. And, and also, um, they really don't have any protection from feathers to help stop the insects from getting in and biting them. And that's really what happens here is, is uh, there's, there's blood carry pathogens um, and other components of the bite that that over time with numbers of bites uh, can just uh, overwhelm the immune system of the of the very small eaglet so um, so we've we we saw that here we've seen the biting we've seen the gnats but we don't typically see them at this stage of eaglet life so in this first week so that was a big difference here um, uh, we have seen kind of a parallel story with uh, the peregrine falcons that we watch, and it's been devastating over in the last uh, three, four years. I think we've had at least two years that uh, um, that they've been very bad to the point that we've lost uh, four, three, four, even five uh, sometimes uh, young uh, peregrine falcons, or the nests are just abandoned by the parents because the 
the black flies uh, gnats uh, are so bad. So um, we've seen them. You know, it's very interesting at the Great Spirit Bluff Falcon Cam. We get to see more of that because we have it cammed up with cameras and we get to see what's happened there. Um, amazing how the parents will recover, um, but we've had falcons just last year, two of them that had succumbed to a similar situation. They had been bitten so many times by, by black flies. Um, the blood loss and the, the pathogens in that that got into their bloodstream actually killed four or two of the four uh, peregrine falcons that we had hatch at Great Spirit Bluff last year. And then the other two that survived, even though we tried to put some repellents and do some things there, we were not able to uh, prevent them from fledging quite early without many of their feathers. And amazingly, the parents took care of them down below the bluff and they, they, they gained flight and we watched them, you know, become uh, fledged falcons uh, and fly around the whole rest of the summer. So um, around rivers, around water, you know, um, and increasingly in this area, we see these, these breakouts of black flies and infestations that are really detrimental to raptors. Very good, John. Well, thank you. I'm going to start. There are lots of questions coming in, so get ready, John. Here we go. So I'm going to go with question one and two. Glenn Hazel Woody. Hi, Glenn Hazel. Nice to see you again. Um, well, do we know anything? So I'll, I'll throw two questions at you, John, here. Do we know anything about the age of the decora male? And the second question is from Sign62. Uh, in your opinion, do eagles have feelings such as the loss with the eagles. Two great questions. Here we go. Uh, I think I lost contact with John, maybe with the... Yeah, oh, yeah. There, there we go. Okay, John, now, now you're on. Okay, come again, please. I, I was uh, wondering if that first question was about the, the Decora North male. Um, or maybe if they had been intending to ask that about the uh, missing or missing dad decor that uh, um, we haven't seen since the 18th of uh, prior month. But um, let me answer for, for the decor North Nest. Um, we do not know the age of uh, the male at decor North Nest. Um, we started watching this nest back in 2015 when we were looking at the possibility of using it as a broadcasted camera and putting or a nest and putting cameras up there. So um, we know that they don't get their white heads and they don't uh, um, start nesting and and uh, that whole process until about five years, four to five years. Uh, so we know he's at least uh, at this point, at least eight years, probably plus uh, old here at this nest. So um, I, I, th I think that answers the first question. Um, the second question, you know, we, we definitely see eagles, you know, do actions and, and, and act as unbelievable parents, you know, in the animal kingdom, in the animal world. Um, I guess there is no way of us, you know, in a concrete way knowing because we can't communicate with them uh, as to whether or not they have feelings or not. Um, a lot of the actions that we see from them, you know, would make us believe that there's, you know, uh, there's dedication there. There are other aspects to their caretaking of the young and just, uh, you know, the, 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 the relationship that they have with their mate, the pair bonding and things that they do that, at least for animals, you know, there's that connection and there's, there's uh, familiarity and there's memory and all that. Uh, um, I can't really say, you know, beyond that, you know, how far the feelings go. Yeah, one thing I can throw in there, um, John, which is interesting, I know that from David Hancock, when we do see that there is a loss uh, of one of the pairs due to an accident, we have seen incredible grieving for one or two days. You know, it's very loud. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but I just have to... Right, support. so, and, and you're right there, and, and David too. Uh, um, well, at, at the Decorah Fish Hatchery Nest, uh, the, the day after uh, Dad Decorah went missing, every morning we got to hear mom decora calling out for him and you know it was i mean for 10 years 
every morning at that time of year when they were incubating or taking care of young. Mom would sit on the nest at night, and then in the early morning hours, she would call out, and Dad would come down from his roost or perch or wherever he was, and he would take in his shift change. So you, we heard those those calling cries, uh, you know, where are you, or calling him to the nest, and then nothing happening. And um, that that is really really hard and tough to uh, to listen to. Um, but I, I agree, we've experienced that. Okay, John, lots of questions coming in, so we have some catching up to do. So here we go. I'm going to uh, put two questions that you heard uh, from, oh, I hope I pronounced the names correct, Dieter Compton. Yes, I hope so. How many eagles have fledged from this pair and this nest? So how many eagles have fledged from this pair and nest? And the other question from E. Rhodes 51 uh, if the eaglets would have hatched at the right time, could they have handled the uh, the, the warm better and and uh, well everything better? Right. Okay. Two very good questions. So let's see. I'm just going to recount through the history here at the Decorah North Nest. Uh, the first, um, I think. Uh, so let's see. When Bob and I were doing reconnaissance out there in the fall of 2015, um, I spotted an uh, eagle down on a log closer towards uh, um, the woods line there. So we knew that we probably had one fledged eagle before we even put a camera up there. So that would have been 2015. 2016, we had one eaglet uh, DN3 die, and we had then uh, DN2 that got poisoned by the methamyl um, that was in a raccoon that was brought up to the nest. So we had DN1 uh, was our first fledge from the nest cam that we saw. Um, and then uh, um, last year we had DN4, DN5, DN6, and we had DN6 parish uh, right in these early, uh, the first week or so, I believe, if I remember right, of uh, after hatch. Um, but then uh, the other two did uh, survive and both successfully fledged. So um, I guess that first year we had one. The first cam deer, we had DN1, and then we had uh, DN4 and DN5. So that's that's our record at this nest. Uh, um, second question is a, is a good one. I, I truly believe that if this would have been in the right time frame, um, we've seen great uh, ability of these eagles over the last year and this year to produce prey uh, and, and consistent food source, uh, better probably than the first year that we were watching them and uh, I, I firmly believe that they would have made it just fine if they would have uh, hatched in their normal time frame or the eggs had been laid and then hatched in the normal time frame. Right, so the time frame is very critical. Next one from Lady Hawk, by the way. Lady Hawk, very nice to have you on the program. The video that you see in the background is from Lady Hawk's channel. Do check that out. She is absolutely dedicated. We have lots of contact. Nice to see you, Lady Hawk. Lady Hawk. So here is the question. I have heard many comments referring to the uncleansiness of the nest harboring the flies and gnats. Uh, can you address whether this had any effects on the eaglets? Uh, and, and yes, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Lady Hawk. Uh, thank you for the, the contributions and the videos. Um, so that question is an interesting one. Um, we both nests that we watch, uh, um, and most of the nests, just because eagles' uh, primary food source typically is fish, they're usually they're by a body of water. So um, in this nest here, I guess cleanliness, uh, I've never seen an eagle nest that was really super clean, I guess, in, 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 in how you use that term clean. Um, we're going to see prey remains, bones, and, and other tissue remains that, that get buried. The eagles will actually cover up the food sometimes, and I guess in times where the, the prey delivery and, and presence and ability of them to bring up is lean, um, they are going to search around in that nest, and they're going to pick through and find every piece of eatable, you know, edible tissue on those. And, and that's what we've seen sometimes at this nest in the past, just because it doesn't seem like it's got quite the food source presence as the, the fish hatchery e eagles, which there's uh, ponds of trout over there that they can uh, have as a resource. So we see a little bit uh, more maybe of a variety of different kinds of preys, mammals, 
fish, others coming up into the net, this nest, but typically they've been cleaned off very well. So um, I think, uh, um, you know, we do, we do have uh, farms in the area and that, uh, you know, you can imagine, you know, anybody who's grown up on a farm, you know, there's flies, there's gnats, there's other things like that. So we are in rural country here where there's farms. Actually, the Decor Fish Hatchery is around farms too, so not a big difference there in cleanliness of the nest with respect to pathogens being bred possibly and things like that. And we always have carrion there and fish and other, you know, food sources that have been uh, fermenting and, and being broken down by organisms for a while. I Sometimes I get a little bit over energetic uh, zooming in with these cameras that are so amazing and you can actually see a fly and a maggot and you know some of the other things that are part of this life cycle with these eagles but I would say overall it's it's as clean as any eagle nest that I've seen or that we've monitored out there. Very good and here's some more good questions. I'm going to put another two questions out for you John. The first one is from Linda Thomas. Wasn't there, any, wasn't there some interference from the eagles migrating through the area that interfered with Mr. and Mrs. North copulating and laying eggs? And what if, would have been the norm? So that's about the, the question of the migration of other eagles. Were there some interference? And the next question from Susie, this is a great one. If a late hatch next year, uh, for, if that happened again, could you take any precautions just as you did with the falcons? Okay, um, uh, two good questions. And I remember early on when, and, and uh, forgive me as far as knowing all the details on, uh, on watching that video, but I do remember seeing some late morning, or actually it would have been early morning hours, um, where we did have some eagles, and it looked like the possibility of, of we were wondering actually there for a while whether or not there was an intruder eagle that had came onto the nest in the early morning hours at the north nest and it looked like some very interesting interaction between mom decora and this other eagle that came on it looked like it was stumbling around it didn't know where it was going and and she actually behaved a little bit different towards it um, and you know, I know that that happened, and then early in the morning after that, you know, that eagle came back, and it appeared that either Dad North came back, and the other eagle left, or it could have been Dad North that it was Dad all the time, and there just was a episode there of unfamiliarity in the dark uh, uh, light there, and that you have to remember that these nests are not lit up like we see, right? Um, we don't uh, we don't have a light out there, and the eagles can't see that light either. So we're, we're dealing with uh, in the early morning hours and nighttime hours, it's totally dark, whatever the ambient light is. So um, that next morning, it looked like there was eagles coming through, and the possibility that there might have been an eagle that came through and and tried to take a a, a swipe at at Dad Decora. So that I'm going from memory. Um, so is that unusual? Um, we get that kind of, you know, eagles are migrating, and this is not necessarily in a major flyway, the decor area there, um, but there's plenty of eagles, and so we were seeing that, and we see a lot of activity that time of year with the eagles defending the area. We'll see them, you know, sticking their head up in the air and, and warning and calling off eagles and other raptors uh, that, are, that are flying through the area. So it's common that time of year. Um, but there was, a, it seemed like a, more of that activity right around the copulating uh, egg laying time of year this year than there was prior years. So that's a, that's a good observation and a good question. And I would say it probably may have had some effect, although uh, one thing that we saw that was really in, of interest is that um, a lot of times it seems like dad, dad at, at whatever nest will bring a fish and mom will eat that and consume that, you know, before she lays eggs. And we did see that she had uh, uh, vomited up uh, almost an entire part of a fish, a trout that she had eaten that that uh, day or that that afternoon. So she, we think maybe it may have been more something going on with her that she was either sick with something, uh, temp, you know, for a while, and that might may have affected the egg laying process. So um, a couple of those things could have happened. So. Um, so as far as the question about 
um, what would happen if this was uh, similar um, and would we intervene if, if uh, they got this bad? Um, I think if I remember the question right, uh, if things happened in this time frame where they did lay eggs at a later date, um, you know, we, we typically, this is actually probably even harder for us to do something out of Eagle Nest uh, compared to uh, the falcon nest because of the protection status of the eagles and things like that. But uh, um, we typically don't intervene and do things uh, um, unless it's something that we can do. At the at the Great Spirit Bluff falcon nest, we have a nest box there. It's man-made nest box. It's something that we put in there in place. It was put in there in 2003 to attract peregrine falcons back to a historic cliff. Uh, where they had uh, um, nested before, and there was some raccoon predation going on there on that lower ledge that we call the Rock Ledge Diner, um, where they prep food and, and they'll sit down there. Um, it, we already have been assisting and helping that one, you know, if you want to say in a sense, uh, you know, it's it's partially, their nest is man-made, and, and they come in and they use it there. Um, we are just, uh, we're coming down there, we're banding them. We're much more intimately connected with the peregrine falcons um, through their life cycle than we are with the, with the eagles. So um, I would tend to say we wouldn't try to add a blower to an eagle's nest. I don't know that there'd be an effective way to do that. Um, we just, you know, we typically will let nature take its course. So um, I, I don't think that we would intervene in, in an eagle's nest like this. Uh, um, so that's just my thoughts on that. Very good. Thank, thank you, John. And now we got we got so many questions. I'm trying to catch up now. <laughs> so, hope uh, uh, here's one from. I hope I pro, uh, pronounce this correctly. Kindle, cat, and and something and gold. I probably mispronounced that. Do the bites create anemia in the chicks? So that's a medical question. And the other one is very much related to that. I noticed that mom and dad eagles have dark marks all over their faces and beaks. Are this from the are these from the flies? Right. So um, the uh, and I just want to mention one thing too. Um, in at these nests, you know, if there was loss of both parents or something like that, I think that's kind of the that's the the case where we. We were, were talking about, you know, where it would be more likely that we would at least, uh, we have federal permits, we have uh, a relationship with state agencies, you know, and we have to go through all that just like anyone else does. But uh, that would be one case where we might be a little bit more likely to possibly try to do something. Um, as far as the, the, the markings uh, um, and the bites, anemia, I'm pretty sure that that's... Uh, um, uh, loss of blood or loss of red blood cells. Am I am I getting that right, Christian? I'm trying to get my. I, I, I think so. I'm not an expert, but I think that's what it is. I, yes, I, I agree. I agree. So, um, definitely. So in the in the cases where we had the autopsies done on the on one of the two peregrine falcons that we saw uh, perish from the the black fly bites last year um, at at uh, Great Spirit Bluff, those falcons. You could see the the blood underneath the skin. So when the Raptor Center uh, did that analysis, Dr. Reddig, in their report, they basically reported it was actually blood loss and the bloodborne pathogens that overwhelmed the immune system of the young falcons. Um, I'm guessing that this probably was very similar situation here. Um, they're very young. They don't have developed immune systems, um, and those pathogens or whatever. Uh, the the fly bites are the flies are carrying you know after numerous bites it just uh, would have overwhelmed them the heat probably you know also is is a factor but uh, I it's my thoughts that it was more the flies and 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 a, and, a, and the anemia or blood loss and possibly that that effect that that caused the the loss of life with the uh, DN7 and DN8. Um, and we did see the gnats, uh, kind of a buildup of them. They will build up in areas where you can see the eagle uh, parent there shaking its head. I think that's Dad Decor, or Dad Decor North. Um, you can see him shaking his head. You could see in, in certain spots on the, on the facial area, eye socket area, um, near beak area, that you'd see little concentrations. Not to mistake, they do a lot of aeration. 
uh, in the nest too. So there's decomposing materials that when they dig their beaks down into the nest to do aeration, and it was a very wet year, so they do that aeration a lot uh, for good reason. Um, a lot of the stuff that you see on his beak is, is you know, just some soiling and, and dirtiness from aerating the nest there. But uh, definitely we could see the, the cameras are good enough that we could see the gnats congregating on them. We could see him wipe his head back and try to, you know, get the, the, the gnat flies off and um, picking them. I think we even saw some picking of them by the parents off of the eaglets. Very well. And Kathy Newton. Hi, Kathy. Good to see you again. It looked like the eaglets weren't fed for a few hours a day. Do you think that is unusual? Um, no. The, um, with what we saw with feeding, we saw a lot of fish being brought up. We saw a lot of feedings. And really the concern, I think, at the early stages of life that we've seen at this nest and other nests is when we've got that cold, inclement weather, the parents will sit tight on the eaglets more than they normally would if the weather is nice. So when you have three eaglets hatching, um, the the challenge there is for that eaglet to get sustenance and food within the first several days. Um, they've got a crop, which is basic, basically a storage bag. And our, our second graders, kindergartners, they call that the snack pack. You got you to gotta love that. You got to laugh at that. But that snack pack there, um, they will eat uh, whatever they can get, and when you see that, that crop bulged out, um, that's there to carry them through um, hours, and they can go for days. Once their crop is filled up, they can go for several days without any more food. So I don't think it had anything to do with, with the lack of food. Right, right. Okay, uh, let's see. Next question. Oh, yeah, from, from jo Johanna Lynn. Why could not someone, this is a really good question, comes again and again, why could not someone go up to the nest and take the babies out? Um, it's a good question. And um, I think that, uh, you know, the thing that we have to think about here is all of the, all the, the eagle nests out there and all the falcon nests and all these raptors that we watch, um, we're getting a chance to see what goes on in eagle's nest. So two, a couple things. Um, do we treat this nest differently than we treat all the others that are out there? There's no way that we could change the natural process that happens at these nests uh, and have an impact on them. There's, there, there's so many. Um, two, would we want to do that? Um, these pathogens that build up, and let's say one of these eaglets did actually live through that. You know, those are things that are part of the national natural evolution process and 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 the ability to deal with these kind of things and evolve their immune systems year on year and that slow process and do that it all depends on the exposure to those things so us uh, you know taking them away from that um, denies them you know something that's been there you know for centuries and decades and and you know all of history of, of bald eagles so um, you know, would we do it because these sites are cammed up and, and many people are watching? Um, we definitely consider, you know, what is it that we can do that's within our power that is not interfering with the natural lives of these eagles? We really do believe in letting nature take its course. And that's really hard for us as humans uh, to watch because we kind of... Uh, project our own humanity on these animals and and probably do more of that than than we know that we're doing um, but uh, our, our our main goal is to show nature um, and it's tough but at the same time it's a good study uh, to have eagles like this that are watched so much um, to see the hardships that they go through um, this isn't just happening at this nest. This is happening at many, many other nests. And Christian, you brought up a good point that we were talking about before. Um, you know, with climate climate change and some of the, the effects of things right. that we believe as scientists that are happening out there, um, these windows, we're actually seeing, you know, and Amy has looked at this, and we're seeing that we're starting to see peregrine falcons come back, uh, we believe, a little bit earlier than they typically ever have. We're seeing some of these windows of, that have been established over time possibly changing because of some of these uh, effects of extreme weather and temperature changes and things like that. So um, I think, you know, this is an educational process 
it's definitely hard to watch. Um, but between the governmental agencies, the, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, federal agencies and state agencies and our, and our scientist board members and other contributors, we have to make that decision. So um, I'm not going to say that uh, um, we wouldn't do it in certain cases, but our, our typical mission is not to interfere. John, and that's a very good point about climate change. That's something that worries us a lot too here in Canada. Um, I wanted to just, um, um, bring on Osprey Mama. Very nice to see you again. Osprey Mama is a very dedicated Osprey watcher from Florida. Uh, she has got a brilliant question exactly in this line, and it's, it's actually more complex if you think about it. Is there a de is there a decline in whatever eats or yeah feeds on the black flies or bugs to keep them help under control? It's a very convoluted question, actually. Yeah, and and uh, I, I don't have a direct answer for that because I'm not uh, I haven't been studying that, but I can kind of infer a few things and share uh, with what we've learned over the last uh, sev since since I've been working with. Uh, uh, the the raptors here with the raptor resource project and and what uh, I've talked over with with some of our our board members Dave Kester Amy Reese uh, Brett Mandernack uh, Neil Reddig and 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 others uh, basically uh, we've seen the pro the pattern that we've we've seen right so we have years that they're bad we have years that they're not bad um, we know that they breed and and they pro they I think they hatch out preferentially in areas where there's running water. I know Amy has studied this more than I have, um, but there's specific areas where uh, they they will they'll hatch and they basically will be more prolific. So um, we know it's it's dependent on the weather. It's depending dependent somewhat on running water. Um, so that's a that's a situational thing where that happens and at the right time. Um, interestingly, at Great Spirit Bluff this year, um, we've seen gnats or flies at both of the eagle nests in Decorah. We just were out and we've started our peregrine falcon monitoring and banding pro process uh, about a week ago. Um, we've got 14 banded peregrine falcons so far. And in the nests that we've gone and taken a look at, we have several of them that we see a significant impact of black flies and gnats uh, already. And that can mean two things, driving the parent away while they're incubating eggs, or after the hatch happens, it can be uh, this, this inability of the young to uh, manage and handle the bites because they don't have feathers to protect them and they don't have the immune systems that are built, built up to protect them yet. So we see it um, happening in focused areas. We see it happen based on the weather patterns and how wet it is in certain areas. Um, so that's about the best I can say is some years it happens, some years it does not. And I'm not sure what the predator, you know, I guess at Great Spirit Bluff, we have all these swallows flying around and we've always looked at that as a positive thing, hoping that, okay, these swallows are going to help keep the gnats and the flies in check. And I'm sure that they do that to a certain degree. Um, last year when they hatched, it was literally... Uh, we coined it as an explosion of black flies. It was there were just so many there, um, from cold weather to boom, a hot weather, 80, 80 some degree day. They just they just exploded that first day, and then they really never went away. So um, I hope that answers the question a little bit. But I, I don't know what other you know, obviously the swallows and maybe some others uh, eat those uh, gnats and bugs, but to remove them from the nest in a, in a number that they wouldn't have an impact. I'm not sure that there's anything out there that could do that. Right. We have to do a lot of catching up, John. <laughs> you're, you're, you give very beautiful, uh, thorough answers, but my goodness, we have a lot of questions here. I'll try to keep it quicker. <laughs> it's very, no, it's, it's very nice. Michelle Mello, very nice to see you. Also from Florida, very nice to see you. Yeah. Is, is there no good so uh, food source nearby, a good food source? Uh, at the Decor North here, at this nest, you can see there's actually a, a creek uh, there um, off in the background. And we see mom and dad, Decor North, uh, fishing over there. We see them taking baths in the creek there. Um, so that's a good source of trout and other some other rough fish and other things there. Um, from what I know of the area, it's not the only creek in the area. So we have a good fish food source there. 
we've got, you know, when in the springtime when uh, we've seen uh, parts of, of uh, uh, deer come up, we've seen parts of turkeys come up, we've seen uh, other small rodents come up, um, we've seen, you know, just about, you know, anything and everything wild in that area come up to this nest. Like I said, probably not as much of a fish food source as there is down at the fish hatchery nest uh, uh, down south of Decorah, um, but plenty of food in this area. So um, other than that first year, I remember, you know, it seemed like there are some periods where that where we were going, you know, a day or so without some significant sources of food. So um, we've seen a little bit of a shy food source here, but not nothing that would necessarily uh, kill the eagles. And, and the parents are sustaining themselves. So if the parents can find food and sustain themselves, they're probably going to be able to find enough for the eaglets. One sec, John. I just have to, um, I don't, I'm getting the wrong feeds here. So let me just uh, bring up this. I'm just going to uh, adjust the background here and just switch off the music. So uh, just give me a second. Here we go. Okay, let's go to the next question. Oh, this has to do with the bedding material uh, from Glen Hazel Woody again. Does the nesting material play uh, a part in the insect uh, infestation? Well, that's a really probably a difficult bacterial question too, the microcosm that you have in a nest, right? Right. right. Um, we've seen some buildup, at least in peregrine nests and things, of, of uh, uh, insects and, and some things that can harm uh, you could imagine that flies hatching and things like that could be a possibility. Um, from what I'm understanding, these gnats and these flies don't hatch out of the eagle nest. They're actually coming from other areas. Um, we've seen the typical, like, I, I'm not going to say it's a house fly, but it looks more like a fly with wings that are visible, not these little small gnats uh, or black flies. We've seen the larger flies come out um, and actually, you know, flies laying their eggs in, rotting, composing, you know, fish carcasses or parts of squirrels or things like that before. Um, but these nest materials here are grasses. There's some hay material. Um, they do pull some of them from farm areas. So, I mean, there's a possibility that there might be something that's introduced there from, from the farms. But uh, we see the same nest materials being used up here as down at the Decor Fish Hatchery. And we see big variations in the in the in the the black fly and the gnats um, at both of these nests. So I think it's more of an outside of the nest thing, um, and the materials, you know, branches obviously um, that are decaying there, some grasses, some straw or hay that they might find near a farm area, um, and then corn husks and things like that. Uh, um, not probably a factor that I'm aware of. Yes, and Susan North, hi Susan, is asking, do you believe that the that this pair will come back next year? Well, that's a crystal ball question. And yeah. then, <laughs> then Kim Wu, uh, a, a really uh, interesting question again, because I think that goes, on, goes through everybody's mind. Is there a pesticide where we could control the bad bugs with? Yeah, and uh, so uh, first question there, that's a good one. Um, I, I'm actually pretty optimistic that there's no reason that, that mom and dad north would not come back to the same nest next year. Um, we've seen them go through what we would term as hardship. Um, you know, that first year uh, we had the, uh, the poisoning through the, the, with the methamyl of mom and then loss of one of the eaglets. And we actually removed that eaglet DN2 out of there because we were afraid that the last eaglet DN one possibly could be could eat it and 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 die also um and we saw mom very sick and and possibly come near death uh, from that that poisoning there um so they came back after that um we saw an eaglet uh, die last year from probably hypothermia um and maybe not getting enough food when it was rainy and they were more protecting the eaglets in some of that cold rainy weather um uh they, they did not change their patterns there so it really looks like they nest to the territory and this is their nest right now. So unless something drives them out of the area or something happens to them, that would, uh, they are nest builders though. And there's always that possibility that for whatever trigger 
could be tripped, uh, they could build a new nest and, and, and do something new. So I'm not predicting that I know of any reason why they would do it. And I think with the intent of the question is, would some of these hardships have, have driven them possibly to maybe go someplace else? Um, I don't think they're going to find a, a better situation in the area. You know, it's all farms. You know, this has got a good food source creek and everything like that. So I don't think so there. Um, as far as some kind of treatment for the nest, I think that goes back again to the, air, the, the question about interfering. Um, we really look at these nests as a window into nature, and it, it's, it's so hard to look at and watch what's going on and see that and say, well, we take care of, you know, mosquitoes and bugs at our homes or, you know, roaches or whatever. We take care of those with pesticides. Why can't we do this at this nest? And, you know, the only difference between this nest and, and you know, 50,000 others out there is because that we have a camera on it. So because we are watching this, it does not have any effect on what's going on in all the other eagle nests out there. So um, uh, the sake of doing it just to comfort us, I think, is, is not enough. And, and it would be pretty tough to do that. We don't know what kind of effect those pesticides could have on the eagles or the eaglets. So we're just not, I don't think that we would be allowed to do it by, by, the, by the agencies that, that allow us our permits to work with eagles. And, and I don't think it's in our mission to, uh, to do that, so. Thank you, very good answer. And, and there are a lot of related questions. So I'm going to uh, amalgamate some of these questions now. Um, uh, this, is an, this is an interesting one, just as a direct question. Maybe, John, we haven't said it like this, but Johanna Lean, asks John, tell us how did the eagles actually die? So a bit more background on that. And then again, Kindle caps and gold are black flies and gnats there because of the uh, steer or the cows? So um, an, again, two good questions. Um, you, those are, are, are ones that you would think of uh, with respect to this. So um, as far as the, uh, the, the cattle that are there, um, uh, we got farms all around the area. Um, it is pastured there. There's streams there. I think what we mentioned is the the black flies and the gnats uh, that we've seen. Um, they're down in the decor area too. We see them with our peregrine falcon nests, um, and they are there basically because of wherever they hatch from. Those the running water bodies, and I really you know. It'd be great if anybody's listening out there who's an entomologist uh, who could who could shed some more light on the source right. of where these are coming. That would be great. Um, so uh, um, I don't believe that. Uh, I mean, there are cattle there. I don't know. Uh, I'm not an expert on what lives inside of a cow pie and things like that. But um, they're all around the area in this nest and and this part of northern Decorah. They are around the fish hatchery eagles down there. Actually, there, there, there's cattle just as close to, uh, almost as close, uh, within several hundred yards of the Decorah fish hatchery eagles as they are at the Decorah North Nest here. So um, I think it's a, a, a localized thing, and it's based on temperature and timing. And I think I want to just remind people that, you know, a lot of questions come up about what could we do about these uh, insect pests because of what we saw at this time of year. Um, I think this is a pretty uh, unlikely situation that we get second clutches like this. Um, it's the first one that we've seen. Um, so in a normal year, we're probably not going to see the kind of effect. But we did see gnats and flies for the other two years that we watched here. It looked like it was affecting them. It looked like it was just a real nuisance watching them shake their head all the time, like we're watching Dad Decora North there do right now. Um, it will not kill an adult bald eagle. We've seen that it will not kill uh, a, uh, a growing lark, older eaglet that has most of its feathers in. Um, we've watched it at this nest and they, they, are, they seem to be able to handle that just fine. So would we put pesticides in when we know that the, eaglet, the eagles can, can manage it? The only difference here is we had eaglets at a time period that those windows of insect hatch and the window of eaglets at young vulnerable stage 
those windows overlapped here this year, so it's kind of a specialized situation. I can't remember, did I answer the first question? <laughs> Remind me. Yeah, because I think you did. Uh, how, how did they actually die? That was the question, oh, right? Um, yes, yes. I think we talked about that before, but I believe probably the largest impact there was the the pathogens carried by the, the gnats and, and the heat. Um, and that was the consensus of our our uh, board members and eagle experts uh, was that that incredible heat. And, and they've been seeing this. I mean, we've been having 90 plus 95 degrees up in, I heard up in northern Minnesota uh, from Jim Greer and others that uh, uh, this this has been happening over a widespread area and it isn't just bald eagles that are being affected by this we've seen you know loons we've seen uh, other uh, bird species that are being rescued from areas where it's on 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 land and possibly doing something because these gnats can get so bad so um yeah and the next question thank you very much good answer and uh, this is from wobby's question mark question mark <laughs> john how rare is it for eagles to have a double clutch because you were talking about it initially um i i'd have to probably ask david or somebody else you know who, who does specific bald eagle research uh, they might have those statistics uh um i i know that uh, through the raptor species it is it can be a common thing to re-clutch after losing a clutch of eggs um, we've talked about it with peregrine falcons. We know what happens with peregrine falcons, other raptors. Um, we haven't seen it that, that, that often. Um, I could take a look at the statistics that we've got, and really the, the thing that would prompt a second clutch is failure of the first one. So what would happen to uh, cause a failure of the first clutch of eggs? One, as we saw here, not laying... Uh, more than one egg and then the egg getting crushed from some some happening there um, Two, it could be uh, Eggs are laid, but none of them hatch, you know, maybe because the weather got below freezing um, Eagles uh, uh, More falcons and uh, some other raptors will only uh, start incubation after the third egg is laid uh, so that can have a factor temperature could to a certain degree, but uh, I'd say it's got to be probably less than 10%. That just that's just my guesstimate. I I really don't know that from any any uh, facts, but just a uh, guess based on what we've seen and the lack of it ever happening at, at any of our nests here before. Uh, I will actually follow that question up, John, because I I'm a prof I know I, yeah I know Professor Bird, who is an expert on this from McGill University. So I'll follow this up up with him. Uh, next question, Angel Meyer. Uh, what will happen if dad doesn't come back? Will mom be alone or mate with another? Well, we see such things very often, actually. Right, right. We've seen that. Uh, I think the Florida nest, uh, there was a mate changeover there, right? Um, and um, we've unfortunately seen that with uh, dad to Cora after over 10 years there, uh, us losing him down at the fish hatchery nest. Um, and I'm not sure if that question was was oriented towards that nest because we we still have both the male and the female here at the decora north nest so i don't think it's an issue um that's for consideration there um but what we've seen and what we hear from raptor experts and and colleagues is that uh there's enough eagles there's enough hawks there's enough raptors around that when there is an open spot they typically are filled quite quickly um and that's exactly what we saw down at the Decora fish hatchery nest is um, we did we saw that calling the first morning. We didn't see dad come in for that first shift on the 19th. And um, we saw even later that day, we were checking to see boots on the ground. Is there another eagle in the area? And we confirmed that there was another eagle and we thought it was a male based on the proximity to mom and the eaglets in the nest. But it wasn't going and into the nest and and mom wasn't treating it the same down at that nest so um, that happened if you want to look at it whether dad decor was driven out by that male or that something happened to dad and there was a male there just boom right like that you know the next day um, what we hear and what we see I believe is that those voids are filled fairly quickly because of the numbers of eagles that are out there and uh, yeah thank you let me just find the next question oh, we had so many questions here 
Oh yes, this is interesting. This is by Sherry M. Uh, when they see the first eagle pass away, I don't know what you mean by they, but uh, when they saw the first eagle pass away uh, and they knew what was happening, why didn't they save the second eagle to, uh, to whoever they refers to? Sure. I, I think I understand. And, and it probably would be us, Raptor Resource Project, or somebody who has influence over the nest. Uh, um, so think about that. I mean, we've talked about this before. Um, one question would come to mind is, would we, could we do anything in time to make a difference? Um, uh, if we are going to go to the lengths of doing that, why wouldn't we just shoot a pesticide up there and fog the whole nest and the fog, fog the whole area? Um, I think it really comes down to this whole thing of um, we're taking this as a window into nature and a gift and an opportunity to see what goes on in nature. And our, our mission really isn't to try to have, you know, zoo animal eagles that are kind of halfway between a, a managed, uh, you know, wildlife uh, area and, and, you know, the totally wild. So um, we, we tend to want to do things like that, but that's not in our mission. And um, I don't know that we would have gotten the authority to do it. Um, I think in cases where we've seen man-made effects that have uh, caused troubles with eagles, osprey, and things like that, like fishing line getting caught around their feet or, or talons or, um, you know, something happening like that where, where the nest is accessible, one. Two, the, the federal or state uh, agencies that allow the access to get into those nests would say, it's okay to do this because this was a man-made problem and we're going to let you fix it with a man-made solution. Um, the insects and things like that here, you know, this is, this is the nature that these eagles are exposed to. So, um, I, I, again, I, I'd say um, we'd have to look at the situation, and um, if it was something that we thought that we could do something and that we should do something and that, that our permits would allow us to do it, we could get the authority to do it, we would try something. But uh, um, we're not going to go in and try to, to change nature on something like that, even as, as tough as it is to look at. Makes complete sense. I, I hear this time and again from David Hancock, what you're saying there. As hard as it is, but uh, I know that David gets so many calls and accusations of not doing things, but he is a biologist. You have to often understand, uh, understand that this is not about nature being cruel. It is just about right. doing the right thing, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Go on. yeah, I was going to say it's a mixed thing. I mean, there's a scientist in me that... Uh, you know, you look at this and it's like, hey, this is really neat. We're going to get to see what happens with uh, unidentified male eagle at Decora. We would have never got to seen that, have seen that if, if Dad Decora hadn't uh, disappeared. Um, on the other side, there's a part of me that's been watching him and panning on him and watching him and, and be, getting to love him for, you know, for years now and others for even longer than, than I have myself. And, and to separate the scientists from the... The sensitive human, you know, person that uh, you know thinks of this these these wonderful creatures as 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 uh, something that that we want to help out. Uh, that's the really tough position to be in is is separating out and being the, on the practical side, and then also looking at it and saying, well, what could we really do for these uh, incredible bald eagles if we wanted to? We could go up and rescue everyone that was in in stress and put them in a in a in a cage or a muse and and have them you know do something else but that that's not part of our mission that's a very good point you used you said that so well i think that affects all of us john that's right okay um so yes this is right so so uh set shell z uh is surprised to see the nest so intact and is wondering aren't the nests affected by the weather and tornadoes in that area oh yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, I tell you what, I have sat and watched through some of the windstorms and the uh, near tornadoes or tornadoes that have passed through the southern Minnesota and Iowa area, and it is amazing to me that even the, you know, we've talked about the camera equipment and what it takes to keep that going with lightning strikes and things like that, and when you watch, you know, the cameras go dead after a lightning strike and then about 10 seconds later it's like oh my gosh the picture came back and you watch that happen a hundred times through the night 
and you see that the camera equipment and, and everything is still working, that's amazing in, it, in its own right. Um, this is a very large nest, and it's, it's a beautifully placed nest. It's on a white oak tree, and the white oak tree is kind of reaching the branches on the edge of a pasture towards the south. And that nest is kind of built on top of about three fairly decent sized branches that are coming off of that white oak tree. Um, and yeah, I've seen uh, um, at uh, out in California at one of the nests out there, uh, um, I saw a, lot, a nest get just totally lifted right out of a tree by high winds um, way back uh, several years ago um, at uh, uh, out in California. But um, they're amazing. Uh, they've done a good job at this nest. Um, we've seen uh, wind take down and snap the tree at our decor nest, and then we, we did build that man-made starter nest, and then they, they, they chose to take it over. Um, but it's much, much more eagle-made now than it is man-made. So um, it is how they build it. It's the location where they build it, and we see that all eagles don't have the same luck or skill or whatever in picking where they where they build their nests or the materials that they have available to them. If these were built in a pine tree or uh, another real softwood tree that was not as old or not structured as well, um, we possibly could see some problems with those nests, but we're very happy that they've they stayed intact. Yeah, and now comes some interesting question. By the way, we have over 300 viewers. Thank you very much for all tuning in and your interest. Oh, and, thank you. And, and thanks for John being here and, and dedicating his time. We're nearly an hour. So, John, you, you have to throw in, because we're live, if it gets too much, because I have questions and questions coming in, you, you tell me when, <laughs> when you're running out of breath. Okay, sure, sure. <laughs> okay we'll continue. I'm going to keep going here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite something, but it's uh, it's such a it's great to see this you know so much interest in this. Um, Susan North again asking, uh, do the eagles actually heal from bites? And then comes a very interesting question here from V S saying that Mama had been gone uh, from the nest all day after seven and eight deer. Yeah, of course the Dakota North seven and eight perished when she finally roosted in a tree across the field, and Dad was on a branch near the nest. Uh, did she already know that the eaglets had passed? Well, that's, again, a question we touched earlier on is, is of course, the emotions and so on. Right, right. Um, I can't say from actually reviewing the video, going back and looking at that, um, when the last time that she had, had been on the nest and saw the eaglets, uh, the female typically takes the night shift and, and uh, um, does the incubation of the eggs and... and um, I'm assuming that uh, that was in the morning there we and she came back, I think the question was, um, or uh, dad was there in the morning and she came back. I would guess that she probably knew already. I, I was quite certain that I remembered reports on Friday afternoon, I think when they perished that one of them, DN7 might have been in the morning, or DN, yeah, DN7 in the morning. Interesting that the the larger eaglet perished first, um, and then the smaller eaglet uh, after that DN8. I was kind of thinking at first that it probably would have been the smaller one. Um, so there's some interesting information to kind of mix into the whole uh, uh, story about what could have possibly caused it. But uh, um, I would guess that she probably knew that they were not viable, and I heard that Dad, Decorah North, was actually footing and trying to move you know, the eagles a little bit and uh, do that possibly on Friday. So I'm guessing that she had already been exposed to the situation and knew what was going on. I don't know that she was not there because of what was going on, possibly mourning or whatever. I think she she probably knew that she didn't need to be there. Um, I think I remember hearing also that dad stayed and was possibly doing some incubation even after they had visibly stopped breathing. Um, so it might have taken him or, or, or possibly Mom North a while to, to notice that they, they weren't viable anymore. Right, and uh, the other question, uh, the, uh, the early question from Susan North was, do the eagles, eagles heal from bites? Oh, I had a little pause there, so I think I heard, are we still going okay? Yes, we are. Sorry. Do the eagles heal from bites? 
Oh yeah, that 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 question too. Um, I believe they do. Yeah, we we know that they've been bitten before. We've seen. Uh, well, we take a look at uh, similar species, uh, the peregrine falcons. We had two of the four that succumbed to bites and died, and the other two didn't. And um, I look back at that and say, boy, what what was that? What was the reason there? Was it two, you know? females or, uh, versus males or, you know, was it a sex type thing? One was more uh, resistant or able to res resist the bites better than the other. Did the others have more bites? And um, I think if it's to a certain level of bites that they can probably handle it. But with what we saw in the peregrine falcons and what we saw that the eaglets were being exposed to, it looked like there were so many flies um, and they couldn't wipe them away like the parents were doing. So once they disappeared and they get underneath that, that downy uh, fluff there, you know, they're there and they can do whatever they need to. Those eagles are pretty defenseless. So um, I have a feeling that uh, um, they would heal and they would probably be able to handle it to a certain level. But when it's that overwhelming, it was probably, you know, just way too much. Okay, there's so many questions that are related. So I'm going to be a little bit selective here. Angel Meyer asked John, uh, what do you think about the new male at the Cora Nest with Mama? That's the one question. And then Brianna Kiesacker asks, could you potentially look into introducing more swallows or bats to naturally help the gnats uh, and fly and to keep them in, in uh, check? And she comments, I'm a first time ego watcher and I'm in love. Well, that's wonderful. Okay. That's great. Right? That's great. Welcome to the club. <laughs> um, uh, as far as uh, down at the Decora Fish Hatchery, like I said, uh, um, the, we're very interested in, in what's happening there. So uh, the first thing that we've noticed there with the unidentified male eagle is that uh, by just being there um, and defending that area, he's assisting mom Decora uh, to a certain extent. So um, uh, that was just an initial uh, effect that, that his presence was having. Um, uh, as time has gone on here and, and he's stayed and comes back, we've, we've watched, we, I've been watching, we've got dedicated people who've been, uh, visiting and, and taking photographs and watching what's going on there. We've been integrating that with what we have of camera footage too. Um, the, uh, um, the benefits that he's bringing, we see that. I'd call it, he and mom Decor are going through a normalization period where first she was uh, starting to accept his presence and the change happening with uh, her maid of 10 years uh, being gone. Um, uh, we saw that she would sit next to him. She would perch next to him as, as early as a couple days right after dad Decor had gone missing. So um, that's pretty interesting right there that uh, there was... Uh, acceptance of him and go sit by him. Um, now it seemed like over time she's gotten a little bit more relaxed and and uh, um, allowed him to get closer to the nest and the eaglets. Um, they're not his, so um, he's not necessarily into. He's not connected and and invested in bringing food or doing things like that out of his own biology. So uh, maybe next year if he's still there, and we hope that, you know, he probably would be the best choice if Dad Decor isn't there, um, uh, that, that they will nest in the same area and that he sticks around. We have seen them uh, doing activities together that are courtship uh, in nature, flying after each other, taking day trips, coming back, you know, call them dates if you want to. Um, they, uh, they've been taking a lot of trips together. Um, they sit on some of the favored perch areas uh, at the fish hatchery up on the maple tree. Um, Dad Decora has been, or, or, uh, since he's been missing, uh, mom still fishes a lot there, but this new male is not, it's, it's a learned process. You don't just come into the area and, hey, there's fish there. There's a lot of people there. Um, he doesn't just go in and get fish like mom De Decor has, has been doing and dad Decor have been doing. So those are learned uh, things here. And, and he's starting to fly over and catch some fish and do some of that. So um, we think it's an overall positive thing. You know, that's moving on. That's moving forward. It's hard to accept the loss of dad Decor. 
Um, but in the best interest of, of mom and the three eaglets, he's benefit, his presence there is benefiting them right now. And, and we hope that he sticks around and that hopefully he's, he's going to be there for some time to come. Yeah, and D. Lion, uh, uh, Lionheart says, John Christian, do you agree that that decor was mourning uh, during the precious moments, and we showed that earlier, by the way, uh, when he uh, spent time with them after they, they uh, passed? Tender, uh, tender was his touching, checking for life, then crying out. Sure, sure. Um, uh, I... It's a great question. I mean, and we, it, it, our minds, it makes us wonder about what's going on inside that eagle, um, and and what what's driving their behaviors. Um, I think, uh, to a certain extent, uh, um, there could be wonder there, or even just instinctive uh, actions of you know, knowing whether they're dead or not. Are they sleeping? Are they dead? This is a difference in behavior that I haven't seen yet. And uh, not knowing whether or not it is the end, I don't know that they can analyze the situation and say, my eaglet, you know, DN7 is not breathing anymore, so um, now it's time to accept that he's dead. I don't know that it's to that level. Um, I, it's just my own feeling that it's, it's not to that level as far as the instinctive uh, behaviors and, um, you know, in a sense, a mourning, you know, process that they go through becoming... Uh, um, uh, present with the new situation and recognizing that and deviating from the behaviors that they've been doing. I mean, he's been incubating that egg and they've had that, you know, the same biological driven behavior for, for, you know, over a month now, and then they kick into the feeding and all, you know, all that they do that, that is, uh, innate and what, what they do for their young. It's amazing as we watch them do that stuff. But, uh, as far as him, uh, you know, consciously going through a mourning process, there I have I have no way of knowing that. Uh, it's, it's it's I think that's a question that we'll always wonder. Uh, thank you very much, John. I, I think what we'll do is slowly get to the end because I mean it's <laughs> it's been quite something. But I I would like to throw in a question myself, which really. Uh, you know, it's something we, we did talk about climate change. Um, I mean, you've been in this area for quite some time. Uh, what is your own observation as far as the climate is concerned without now saying what the cause of the, the, the things is? But do you actually, um, you know, through all the years, have you actually seen a, a, um, a change in temperature climate in your area? Well, I think the thing that we notice the most are some of these extreme weather events and, and, uh, um, I'm not a meteorologist, but I but I guess I've uh, uh, tended to listen to the meteorologists here in the Minnesota area. And from what I remember hearing is that, uh, um, if I remember this right, was was being in the central part of the country that some of the effects of climate change are more focused here in the Midwest and Minnesota area. So um, I believe I remember hearing that. Uh, with that said. Um, I'm getting older, so but I don't think my memory is that bad. Uh, you know, we know we look at these records like uh, we are breaking records in temperatures, and when it happens year after year that we're breaking new temperature records, there's a trend there. Um, so it's something that we know is actually happening. Um, uh, to say that, uh, um, have we ever had an Easter snowstorm before? You know, some of these recent things that affected the Decoroness, um, I think we've had snowstorms. I'd have to take a look at the historical records, but um, I think uh, the events that that we're seeing are are, from what I can tell, without doing a, a, a statistical study of it, leave that to the meteorologists and others to look at their data. But it seems like we're having more of these extreme events, and that's what was predicted, and that's what we're actually observing. So, um, with that it, that said, if that's happening. We're seeing what some of these effects can have on um, on natural populations like eagles or eaglets. Um, the peregrine falcons, if they're coming back from their migration, uh, and, and I can't say that this is a, a, a specific thing that has been uh, documented beyond just our wonderment and the ability of uh, Amy and others to take a look at our data for when we earliest 
we have seen the earliest Falcons come back. I think that we're seeing some early trends there and some early analysis of the data that it looks like they might be re returning a little bit earlier. So that's a great question. Is that happening because of climate change? Um, but I think we brought up the, the, the really interesting uh, question there, and that is, as these timelines might start changing and there's effects on different species, everything is so interconnected. And I wanted to mention that when somebody talked about the swallows, and that is we've seen what happens when we introduce species to try to do good. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got Asian beetles and, and others that, you know, we, we just get used to them because somebody had a, a good idea and maybe, maybe Asian beetles was one of them but other invasive species that we introduce uh, and then they go out of control. So would we ever try to, to attract more, you know, maybe put some purple martin houses up or do something like that. But we got plenty of uh, um, uh, swallows and things that are around the farm areas there. Um, but these interactions between the different species that are all interconnected, insect, mammals, avian, um, we, they're so complicated and so intricate uh, that we cannot know all the effects that these Absolutely. things have. Absolutely. So what we can say is we are, we're measuring and we're seeing uh, these extreme events. They're, I think they're more frequent and we know they're probably having some impact on some species and, and it looks like we might be able to see some of those uh, happening here over the last couple decades with, with tracking some of the stuff with raptors. Right, and to close off slowly, I'm just going to put a, this has come from several, also Osprey Mama. Thank you, John and the Raptor Centers for doing all the help. You do the excellent work and the balance or with all the birds. So thank you to you uh, and, and of course to Amy and to others. And um, then Wanda L says, um, read that the gnats carry bacteria and young eaglets immune system is not strong enough to combat. Uh, so that they can, uh, be, so that their own bacteria or their 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 own immune system could have played a role in this. I, I think that's probably correct. That's what I well, guess. Of, yeah, that's part of the answer. I mean, they're mm -hmm. so young; their mm -hmm. their immune system is not developed. And let's say you get one or two bites, and your immune system can can uh, handle that and respond. Then you're going to be stronger after that. Um, so the over, I think the overwhelming response at that young age, they've never been exposed to those bites. She's exactly right. Right, and then the final remark or question was, was it not too hot for the eaglets to be brooded by either parent? Uh, we believe that the heat was definitely, uh, it had an effect on the proliferation of the insects that were there. Um, probably something to do with the hatching uh, um, and how many are there, um, but the temperature definitely. Um, we see with our peregrine falcons that we've been, been uh uh, monitoring and banding over the last week or so that when they're in these 90 plus degree hot weather days that they're much more docile and it seems like a lot of their energy can be sapped and um, they're probably more lethargic because of that because of the extreme heat and obviously they need to stay cool and and they're getting almost all their moisture through their food source they don't they don't drink water um, uh, We've seen eagles drink water, but obviously these can't. They're up in the nest. Um, it's not as much of their diet. So, um, yeah, that that uh, definitely played a part. We believe the heat the heat did. And um, I guess I I'll, I'll say before I forget, I just want to thank uh, um, all the folks that are watching out there. You know, you're learning about this. It's tough to watch. Uh, they're beautiful creatures, animals, and we see so many things uh, in them that that uh, are like what what we do or would would want to be like as far as parents or things like that. So it's neat to watch that and be able to laugh at it and, and love them. Um, it's great research. Um, I'm so proud of uh, Amy and our decor or our decor eagle uh, educational moderators and the people who handle that and 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 get that program out to the classrooms that are watching the live eagle cam and then they 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 do their their stem work and things about the life cycle of the eagles through the year and are really engaged in that uh, um, it's really important that we develop these young youngsters that that love the nature that's around them and hopefully we'll we'll take care of it uh, beyond our time here christian 
Yeah, John, you said that very well. I, you know, you can be very proud of the Raptor Resource Center. I mean, I've seen the excellent work that you do and Amy has done. I mean, my goodness, uh, such beautiful uh, work. When I was uh, starting off, uh, uh, you know, I was referring to a lot of her, uh, you know, educational uh, blogs, which are wonderful. So really... Um, yeah. Kudos to you and <laughs> to the whole organization. Absolutely fantastic. And I think, you know, um, stop, you know, to, to end on a very positive note. Uh, if you look now on explore.org and you watch the decor nest, you will see there's mom and dad. They continue. Okay. Life goes on. And yes, uh, someone also said they will be back next year. I'm sure they will. Life goes on. And it's part of the cycle that we all go through. We go through happiness, grieving. It's it's very it's very polarized and 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 i think that is what keeps us going too if we would just have a very normal life we couldn't be happy right. too if we don't go through grief so that's just yeah. my, my final yeah. comment well, well it's amazing to experience that through these eagles and it uh, a lot of the same emotions right and uh, yes i think that yes that, you know when when neil reddick and, and bob were working on the american eagle movie that they just saw the interest of all the people that were coming by and asking questions about that and and looked at that as a possible educational opportunity and, and what a educational opportunity that was in 2011 and the years beyond that. So um, it's it's amazing what that has, has grown into with all the other folks out there, you know, American Eagle Foundation and the other cameras and things that are out there and the nature cams with Explore. It's just an amazing way to try to help people People get connected with nature and and uh, and understand it really. I mean, that we're seeing here right now just uh, the grief that people have, just trying to accept uh, what we're seeing here, um, seeing nature happen, and then even pondering on how we're even affecting it and maybe detrimentally affecting it. That those are some tough things to think about, but uh, beautiful to watch them. They life will go on in the eagle's nest, right? Very right. Yes, absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, we're so lucky now that we have the technology to, to you know, to witness this and, and without interfering. I, th I think this is uh, a great gift. The, you know, the evolution of, of, of these uh, wild cams uh, throughout nature is just wonderful. Anyway, um, so th I would like to thank all of you from, from, from both John and myself for participating in this, all your incredible questions which have contributed to a very interesting and educational live stream. And thank you so much, John, for participating. Uh, it's been a pleasure. So, uh, yeah. And what I'll do is, um, after, after you say goodbye to everyone, um, I'll have a quick chat with you. Uh, then I'll just say goodbye. We'll have a quick chat afterwards. So stay on the line, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Very good. So let me just put the put this correct. Well, I would like to say thank you very much for participating. It's been so wonderful and um, a very intense session, I must say, and very emotional too. And I think we've learned a lot. So um, I just wanted to say on Friday we have another show. And um, so, so do um, stay tuned and... Um, do watch all the Eagle cams and um, if you like what we do, subscribe to Zasa Photo. Uh, this is all educational, not for profit, uh, voluntary. I've got a great team, by the way, a great team uh, there. You've seen Jani, uh, you've seen uh, Nicole, uh, and um, gosh, I don't want to leave anyone out here. <laughs> I, I'm always terrible. I'm just a little bit tired at the moment. So, but anyway, I've I've, I've got a great team. So thank you, thank you so much for uh, for 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 watching. Yeah, I also saw Belladonna, by the way. That is uh, that is fantastic. And Susie, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank. Right. Yeah, Joe. John, John is just saying you can't you can't hear him, but he's saying thank you very much to all the team and so on. So anyway, it's uh, it's 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 wonderful to have you, and uh, yeah, take care. I'll just put a nice picture on the background because uh, you're actually not so. Um, gosh, I, I can't even yeah I can't even influence that at the moment. Don't know what's going on. I think the computer is also getting tired. So goodbye, <laughs> goodbye to everyone, and thanks so much, and have have a good day.